going by quickly. We're covering a lot of material, aren't we, in a short amount of time. And good evening also to our off-site students. I hope you enjoyed the conference as much as I did. Uh, it was really wonderful for me to meet uh, the students who are not part of the DBC group so that I could see you and put a face to the work and the assignments that you're doing and the questions that you ask. And I enjoyed the conference for many reasons. It was spiritually uplifting and encouraging. And also, it substantiated the importance of English grammar. Did you hear that? It's almost like you probably thought, I think Carol put them up to this, <laughs> to sell the fact that English grammar is so important in the study of scripture. Uh, there were many references to the topics and concepts that we are already studying. Did you pick up on that? And we're only I covered two lessons, but uh, the speakers talked about nouns. They referenced those frequently. They also referred to determiners or articles and how important it is to find the a and the the when you're doing the exegesis of the scriptures. They also referred to the relevance of pronouns. And I don't know if you recall, but uh, Andy Wood even talked about demonstrative pronouns. And that's a reference that he used. Verbs was a big hit at the conference. I don't care who the speaker was, they brought up verbs and they talked about the transitive verbs and the intransitive verbs and how important it is to look at the verbs in your sentence, determine the meaning behind them. Uh, you also heard them talk about adjectives and also prepositions, which we're going to study at our next session. But uh, the conference showed us the importance of the work that you're doing. And I'm grateful that I can be um, here as your instructor and help you in that process. You also heard from the speakers the importance of finding the object of the verb. Uh, they were talking about the direct object and the subject complement or predicate nominative, and that's going to be our lesson for this evening. And we're going to study about the complements of the verb, and notice how that's spelled there, because in this case, the complement definition is a word or words that completes the meaning of the verb. So that's our topic for tonight. In lesson one, if you recall, we studied nouns and pronouns, and we found that nouns and pronouns can be used in many ways. They float around in the sentence, that they can be used as a subject of a sentence, or they can be used as an object in a sentence. They can be used as an object of the preposition. So always have to look to see how they're being used in the sentence to find out the meaning of that particular verse. So tonight, in particular, we're going to see how nouns or pronouns can be used as direct objects, uh, indirect objects, objective complements, or predicate nominatives. So I bet you can't wait, can you? <laughs> but before we do, we're going to do a review. And I think sometimes the review of a previous lesson or lessons is just as important as a lesson itself. Now I have your assignments in my folder, and those of you who are off-site students, I put them in Tom Stiegel's mailbox, and he's going to be sending them to you. And then the on-site students, I'll give them to you at the end of the session, and then you can give me your assignments. Uh, there, it was a 140-point assignment, the first one. There was a lot of work to do in finding nouns and pronouns in the verses, and the, the class did very well, so I'm very pleased. I did take time with them, and I just wrote notes. If you made a mistake, I just referenced the correct pronoun or noun, and so you can learn from that as well. So put that away, and hopefully that'll be a good resource for you. Uh, I hope that you understand that the study of grammar is not just an intellectual enterprise in our Gibbs courses. If you were in a college classroom, that would be the case. It would be mere academics and an academic study. But here at Gibbs, it's far more than that. Yes, it's academic. There's no question about it. But it's also to aid your personal study of the Word of God, and I want to emphasize that. Your own personal study as you, work, as you develop your relationship with our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I was reminded of that this past week. I was studying the story of Jacob, and I was reading... Uh, Genesis 28, 13 through 15, and we're going to look at that in just a minute. But I want you to recall what a pronoun is. Remember the definition? A pronoun does what? It 
takes the place of a noun. And its title means for the noun. Don't you like that? And it has three different persons to it. A personal pronouns can have a first person, a second person, and a third person. It indicates the speaker, the person spoken to, or the things or persons spoken about. And that's your third person. And the first person uses the personal pronouns I, we, me, and us. Second person uses you, singular or plural. And the third person, he, she, it, they, them, and also in the possessives. So when I was reading Genesis 28, 13 through 15, and you can turn to that, please. This is what I found. I mentioned to you that we have a personal God, and the Word of God is filled with personal pronouns. And this was very evident to me when I was reading in Genesis 28, verses 12 through uh, 16. This is the story of where Jacob was at Bethel, one of the significant places of Scripture. Bethel means the house of God. And Jacob had just left his home. His mother sent him away because he had deceived his father and he had deceived his brother Esau and he was fearful for his life where his mother was. And so off you go. Go to my brother Laban and stay there for a few months, supposedly. And so he finds this place to rest. And at this place of rest, when he slept, he had a dream in which he saw a ladder or a stairway with angels going up and down between heaven and earth. We're starting in verse 12. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there were the angels of God, were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed. All the families of the earth will be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. But the repetition of the personal pronoun I just stood out as a neon light to me. And I realized the personal God that Jacob had and the personal God that I have as well. And this is what the study of grammar should do. Not, again, for you to complete your assignments, though you want to do that well. But even more importantly, that it gives you this appreciation for the word of God as you go in there and look at what's going on in the verses. And it makes it even clearer to you and even more relevant to you as well. So that's my prayer for you. And as I have mentioned to you, you are on my prayer list. Once you're a gift student, you stay on that prayer list. And I pray for you almost daily regarding your study and that this course will be relevant to you and helpful to you, not only in ministry, but more importantly, in your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So with that as my introduction, it's time for us to go and review some of the concepts we've learned the last two weeks. Let's go back and talk about pronouns, if you don't mind for a minute. Remember what I said, pronouns are tricky. Uh, no one is exempt from having his or her pronoun second guessed. And things can get complicated when a pronoun, like any good understudy, takes on different guises depending on its role it plays in the sentence. And some pronouns are so well disguised that you may not be able to tell one from the other. So here's the rule when it comes to our pronouns and make sure that we use them correctly. When a pronoun follows a linking verb, such as the verb is, it should be in the subjective case, being used as a subject in the sentence or in the predicate nominative position. And since written English is more formal than conversational English, 
Anyone who wants to use it correctly has to get a grip on these pronouns, and you will be able to do that because you'll be able to understand the cases of the pronouns and which case that pronoun will fall. Now, these days, anyone who says, it is I, is sometimes viewed as a stuffed shirt, but it wasn't always so in bygone days. Uh, you might have had your knuckles wrapped for saying it's me instead of it is I. What would your crime have been? A pronoun following the verb to be, which should act like a subject and not an object. So which is correct? Is it between you and I, or is it between you and me? Is it he is a man whom can do the job, or he is a man who can do the job? Do we say it is me, or do we say it is I? Do we say this is she or he, or do we say this is her or him? By the end of this evening, you'll be able to say, I know exactly which pronoun to look at and to select because of the case that it falls in. Because remember, when a pronoun follows a linking verb, and you learned about those last week, such as is, it should be in the subjective case. Now, most find the old usage awkward. But I have to admit that I still use this is she when somebody asks for me on the phone because old habits die harder than old rules. And when you're an English instructor, it's in your genetics. You just can't help yourself. So, but you two are going to be communicators of God's word in one capacity or another. And so it's important that you learn how to write it correctly and also speak it correctly. And so that's what this course is designed to help you to do as well. And also we're going to be looking at the who and whom which are often used incorrectly. Who is in the nominative form of the pronoun and is used when a subject of the verb or predicate noun is needed and whom is in the objective form of the pronoun and it's used when it's a direct object, an indirect object, or an object of the preposition is needed. And again, those are the concepts we're going to be covering this evening. I think I've mentioned to you that it's really interesting for me to watch this occur that when I'm at a gathering and somebody introduces me to someone else and says, hi, I want you to meet Carol Helen. She's an English teacher. And right away, the expression, oh, well, I don't have very good English. <laughs> they tend to make excuses or they freeze up. It's just like what happens to you when you're looking in the rear view mirror of your car as you're cruising down the highway and you see the highway patrol in back of you. <laughs> You think, oh my, I've got to watch my manners here on the road. So this is what I ask of you. This is my statement. I used to love correcting people's grammar until I realized what I loved more was having friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope I'm your friends. Uh, this is my role. This is my assignment to help you with your English and to help you with your grammar. So I want to be your friends, but please know that I see that as one of my roles to play is to help you in the proper use and terminology of English grammar. So we'll be friends, and I won't try to correct other people's grammar, just yours and my family's, but my family has good grammar, so I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> uh, here's a question for you as we would go through our review. Uh, this is for the mechanical engineers, and I know I have several here as students. Could you define for me what is a chassis? on a vehicle? It's the frame and wheels and suspension, so the parts that you can, the minimum amount of a car that you can have and roll it. So it's the um, basics, yep. basics of the vehicle. You said that so well, you kind of said it better for where I'm going to segue. Um, it is the frame structure, isn't it, uh, around which the rest of the car is built or the vehicle is built. So everything else on the car, correct me if I'm wrong, attaches to the chassis, either directly or indirectly. And this is a good analogy for us to use, or a good picture to use, regarding the sentence structures that we're going to see develop in our grammar study. Do you remember last week we learned about the baseline of our subjects and verbs? And we, that indeed is more like the chassis of the automobile. That is where you have your main framework of the sentences. So when I ask the question, what two parts must a sentence have in order to be complete? What's your answer to that? Subject and predicate, absolutely. 
Nouns or pronouns are used as a subject, and the verb is used as a predicate. Now, we saw last week also that a sentence, we can identify either a simple verb or a simple subject or a complete predicate or a complete subject. And I asked of you just to identify the simple subject and the simple verb this week. Were you able to do that? OK. For the most part. Yeah, we'll see. OK, we'll see. Uh -huh. yeah. Stay tuned is oh, the answer okay. to that one. OK, I will uh, let you know in the next session. <laughs> But the subject and the predicate are the basis of the sentence structure. Just keep that in mind, because we're going to start building on our vehicle. We're going to start adding more pieces to it. And I don't want you to get discombobulated by it, thinking, oh my goodness, where is this all going? Just keep in mind, OK, what's my framework? And then we're going to build our sentences from there. All right, you answered that one well. Let's try this one. Subjects can be a, I should have put the A in there blank, blank, phrase or clause about which the sentence says or asks something. What completes that statement? Subjects can be a noun or a pronoun, thank you, a phrase or clause about which the sentence says or asks something. The subject is the word with which the what agrees. Absolutely, the verb. And it's supposed to agree in number. Both be singular or both be plural, but most agreement problems come for students, I've noticed, when the subject and the verb get separated by distracting business in between them in the sentence. So we're going to be able to work through that in this course as well. In standard prose, the subject usually comes before the verb. And if it doesn't come before, what type of sentence do we have? What's that called? If it Inverted sentence, yes. And my statement is that is that when you have your subject and verb in that order, that does sound quite often more forceful and more direct than one written the other way around in an inverted sentence. But every now and then, it's appropriate to put the verb first. And the Bible and literature are full of poetic examples preceding their subjects. And we're going to see some verses tonight from scripture that do that very thing. Uh, what is meant by the term compound subject? Now, two or more subjects, doesn't it? And what is the most interesting word in a sentence? The verb. It's the core of every sentence. It's the business end of the sentence. If you have only one word in the sentence, it's going to be a verb. Listen to this one. Stop. <laughs> Listen. Now, we know what the subject is in those, don't we? What is it? Yeah, you. See, understood you. But you can get by with that by having only one word, and that word can be the verb. So we respect our verbs in our sentences. With that in mind, list the various categories of verbs. Recall that the verb's function within a particular sentence determines its classification. So can you give those to me, please? We have action verbs, we have linking verbs, and we have helping verbs, or auxiliary verbs. Very good. Linking verbs aren't about actions as much as they are about what with other words together. Connecting. For the most part, they act as a what kind of sign in the sentence? equal sign. And I was visiting with some of my students at the conference, and those of you who like mathematics say this has really been good for me to understand that grammar is very mathematical. It's very geometric as well. It has equations, but it's also full of art. <laughs> so it's just a really interesting study. But you're going to see that grammar is very mechanical and has formulas to it that makes it um, better for us, easier to follow. Uh, the verb what is a basic linking verb? Be. Yes. The verb be is a basic linking verb. The word is is a form of the verb to be. Not all verbs are main verbs. Some verbs appear together with main verbs to form a yeah, verb phrase. Yes. That indicates certain shadings of action or time. These are called auxiliary or helping 
verbs. All right, then we have our helping verbs that fall into families. And remember I said sometimes it's good to memorize these because that's easier for you to find when you're working on your sentences. So can you give me the verbs from the B family? Was, were, be, being, been, am. It's really good for you to memorize that because you're going to have to find those and it's good when you have it right here. Is, are, was, were, be, being, been, am. Then we have those helping verbs that from the have family. Remember what they are? Have, has, had. And then the do family. Do, does, did. And then we have that modal family. And remember the modal family indicates mood and it's used in the indicative and the subjunctive. And do you remember what the modal verbs are? Those are harder, aren't they? Shall, would, sh uh, shall, will, should, would, may, might, must, can, could. And it's important us, for us to remember that because that's part of our, the moods that we were talking about that verbs get into. I also wanted to make this note. Remember we saw this last week, an adverb may occur within a verb phrase, often between the auxiliary and the main verb. And we met such an adverb last week, not. And here's some other ones, never, even, always, then. And there's your mnemonic neat if you want to remember it that way. And hardly, already, and just, sometimes occur. So sometimes they just budge their way in between a verb phrase, but we're not going to identify them as a verb because now we know they're adverbs. Now, I mentioned that verbs express time, voice, and mood. Verbs are very complicated, and so we're going to learn them well. Mood in verbs refers to one of the three attitudes that a writer or speaker has to what is being written or spoken about. So we have the imperative mood. Can you tell me just a little bit about the imperative mood? It gives a command or it makes a request. And it also has a very unique uh, pattern to it. It has the understood you. So it's there, but it's not there because it's not written quite often. And also, um, this is the second person singular or plural subject with the understood you. What about the indicative mood? Making a statement or asking a factual question, isn't it? And most verb forms we use every day fall into the indicative mood. When I use the word mood, another word that is synonymous with that is mode. And then they have the subjunctive mood. And what is that? It's important for you students to understand the subjunctive. Can you say that again, please? I think you have it right there. Yeah, very good. Mood of possibility, um, what may or might be, expresses probability, sometimes exhortation. So a subjunctive verb means to communicate such feelings as wishfulness, hopefulness, and imagination. And it's interesting in English because we have a special way of speaking wishfully. I gave you the example last week, but I'm going to bring it back again. I wish I were taller. Now, did you notice that I did not use the verb was? I used the verb were because were follows the word if. Because if often means you're wishing or imagining. Imagine if I were taller. I wish I were taller. Do you remember the cowardly lion from The Wizard of Oz? And he got up to sing this song, and he sang it, if I were king of the forest. Do you remember that? He was in the wishing mode, and he used his grammar correctly. He didn't say, I wish I was king of the forest, because he knew he was wishing for bravery. Uh, it's interesting in the subjective, subjunctive sentences, the verb would or could accompanies the statement, because these are wishful words. And when we are in the iffy mood, and if is important when we're in the subjunctive, this happens when a sentence or clause starts with if. What's being con talked about is contrary to fact. It's called the if-then formula. Now, the subjunctive is not as important in English 
as you'll find it is in Greek. And in Greek, it tends to be more subtle, more discriminating and hypothetical, doubtful, or wishful expressions. In English, we tend to be more satisfied just using our auxiliary verbs. You know, shall, will, should, would, may, might, must, can, could. But when you study Greek, you'll be presented with a more fully developed system of conditional sentences, and they'll have a remarkable degree of precision that can be obtained in expressing condition or thought. Just like you'll find when you go into 1 John 1, verses 6 through 10, and you find a series of subjunctive clauses starting with it. So this is what you have to look forward to when you get to your Greek studies. Uh, can you share with me the four sentence types? And in the English language, we're very, very pleased that we have four sentence types, which gives us variety in our speaking and in our writing. So the most used is declarative. And can you give me the definition of a declarative sentence? Makes a statement, doesn't it? Or a declaration. And it ends with a period. Now I want you to listen to me as I give you four different sentences using the idea of being grateful. Here it is in declarative. You should be very grateful. See, they're making a declaration. I'm making a statement. What about if I'm in the imperative sentence? What does that mean again? Command or request, and the subject is missing. It's the understood you. It ends with a period. Sometimes you can end it with an exclamation point. Listen to this imperative. Be very grateful. Do you hear the difference? Here it was in the declarative. You should be very grateful. Here it is in the imperative. Be very grateful, starting with the verb be. What about an interrogative? What does that do? Ask a question. The root word is interrogate. And it ends with a question mark. Now, there are two types of interrogative questions. One is an open-ended question, and one is a closed question. If you are a teacher or you are a parent, you want to ask a lot of open-ended questions. Here's an example. How grateful should you be? When you're asking that open question, it demands somebody to give an explanation, doesn't it? Here's the closed interrogative. Should you be very grateful? And what answer would you typically get? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or mm-mm. <laughs> so it just allows you to just have a one-word response. So good teachers understand the importance, and lawyers too, <laughs> of asking open-ended questions. So those are the two types of interrogative. And the exclamatory statements or sentences, what are they like? Exclamatory <laughs> shows sudden or strong feeling. And they usually start with these words, oh, how, or what. And here's an exclamatory sentence. How grateful you should be, exclamation mark. So do you hear the different sentences there as we're using the same theme of gratefulness? Now, define for me, please, the transitive and intransitive verbs. And we talked about that last session, so I think I can ask it. Can you give me the definition for a transitive verb? Excellent. It requires an object. It takes the action on something, doesn't it, which is the object. And if you remove the object from the sentence, it just would not make sense. And then what is an intransitive verb? Does not need an object, doesn't it? They can take action all by themselves. And I mentioned last time that linking verbs have traditionally been called intransitive. So let's look at these two verses. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Remember the process we go through? We look for our verb first. Can you give it to me, please? All right, okay, do lay. Remember, we don't underline not, because not is not a verb, it is an adverb. And what's the subject there in that sentence? You, okay, you do not lay what? Hand, there's the object of lay, and that's considered its direct object. And remember, we said we do not find 
abstract objects and prepositional phrases. Because if we took that object out of there, do not lay on the boy, it doesn't make sense, doesn't it? So we needed that object to complete the meaning of the verb. Uh, you will lie down and not be afraid. <laughs> okay, give me the verb, please. Whoops. This is very sensitive, so I have to watch when I'm marking on here. Uh, down is an adverb, and what is the, uh, another verb in this? Be, thank you. There's be. So there it did not have an object, did it? So there we have an intransitive example. I'm interested to know the answer for the next question. How does diagramming assist in analyzing a sentence? How did that assist you? And it shows you how the words relate to the main meaning of the sentence. It really brings them out clearly, doesn't it? They're not hidden in the, in the verses of the sentence anymore, does it? It helps you reorganize. Yes. It does, doesn't it? And it lets you see, first of all, the main idea of what's going on there. And I cannot tell you how helpful it is to me, not only in my personal study, but also when I'm studying for uh, a speaking assignment or an arrangement, that I go in there and I diagram and I see what the main idea is. Also, one of the advantages of outline is that it forces you to take a very careful look at the structure and meaning of the text. And this is so important uh, in studying any well-written literary or legal document, but this is particularly true in the study of the Bible. And I mentioned last time that diagramming sentences has not been much in vogue for the past 30 years, for one reason or the other. But diagramming took us all the way back to 1857 with Alonzo Reed and Brainerd Kellogg, who developed the system. So the diagrams that we use in this class are the Reed Kellogg diagrams. And there have been many grammarians and English instructors, however, who hold that analyzing a sentence and portraying its structure with a consistent visual element and scheme can be very helpful, especially for grammar beginners, but also for those who are trying to get a sense of the language at any level. And, and also, this is true if you're a visual learner, this really works well for students who are in that uh, capacity. And when you watch a sentence take root and you ramify it in space, it can actually be, yes, fun. <laughs> Did you have fun this week? <laughs> it can be fun as you start seeing it and coming apart and putting it back together. So there's our review. And now we're ready to move into the main section of the lesson. So we're going to talk about compliments tonight. Some sentences are complete with just a subject and verb. And here are some examples. Jesus wept. The ointment stung. The mail must be delivered. The machine stopped. With that in mind, do you have your handouts for this week? Are they in front of you? because we're going to be referring to some of the pages in the handout, so you can have that uh, available as we start moving through. And in fact, the next section, I think you're going to be on page two of your handout. So if you want to take notes or do some work regarding the verses or the sentences that I have, feel free to do that. Many sentences depend on additional words to finish the idea begun by the subject and verb to complete its meaning. Let's look at two examples. God loved us and sent his son. Will you tell me the verbs, please? Loved and sent. Who loved and sent? God. There's my subject. God loved whom? There's your direct object. And God sent whom? Son. So we have two objects, if you will, coming off that verb, that active verb, loved. 
Direct objects are made up of a noun or a pronoun, and they receive the action of the predicate. And it answers a question. You probably could hear me, hear me ask those questions. Whom or what? And a direct object usually follows an action verb in the active voice. And the subject performs the action. And remember, in the passive voice, the subject receives the action. It is very necessary for you to understand how to find direct objects because it's such an important component of their language and also the study of scripture and the interpretation of verses. Let's look at the next sentence, and I hope my husband Barry doesn't mind that I wrote this, but this is true of him. What is the verb in my husband continuously mislays his glasses? Mislays. All right. Who mislays? My husband. He mislays what? Glasses. There, mislays, direct object is coming off of that verb mislays, and it tells me what he mislays. You follow the process. These are quite easy to find, actually. So there are types of complements. The direct object, it's an accusative case. That's a Latin term, actually. And I put that down there because this is the terms that you're going to see when you get into your Greek studies. A direct object receives the action of the verb directly, and not all verbs take direct objects. So that's why it's important we go through a process to make sure we can find them or not. Direct objects can be nouns or pronouns, and we ask the question, whom or what after the verb? So let's try a few more verses and see how we do. From Psalm 105, 8a, he has remembered his covenant forever. What's the verb? The verb phrase, who has remembered? What has he remembered? Covenant. From Psalm 23, 2b, he leads me beside the still waters. Leads. Who leads? Subject. Who does he lead? There it is, the pronoun. And that's, again, the personal side. He leads me. There's a whole thought. There's a whole message in just that thought right there. He leads me besides the waters, as David wrote this. Let's look at some other examples. All right, I think uh, some of these examples are found in your handout on pages three and four, if you want to go in there. The direct object can serve, again, as a noun or a pronoun. It receives the action of the verb. It shows results of that action. The wise man built his house upon a rock. Well, that's quite a rock that this wise man built it on. <laughs> I don't know how wise he was. <laughs> but with that in mind, we will analyze what's going on in this sentence. What's my verb? Built. Active voice. Who built? Man. There's my subject. The man built what? There's my, my question. House. And there's my direct object. It's the receiver of what he built. From Romans 2.16, soon God will judge man's secrets through Jesus Christ. What's my verb? We'll judge. I have a verb phrase there, don't I? Who will judge? God, there's my subject. God will judge what? Secrets. Very good. Of course, it's a prepositional phrase, and we know we don't find our correct objects there. Again, my reminder is you cannot find your subjects. You cannot find your direct objects in prepositional phrases. We'll get into prepositional phrases more in detail in our next session, but I just want to make sure you're aware of this. Let's take Matthew 1129a. Take my yoke upon you. What's your verb? Active voice. What's my subject? You. It's the understood you. You take. You take what? Yoke. Yoke. There's my direct object. Coming off the active voice or the active verb, take. So 
So it, the pattern is you have your subject, you have your active verb, and you have your direct object. I think the more practice that we do, the better we'll be at this. So we'll have a lot of practice slides if you don't mind. And some of these will be found in your handout. Uh, we should praise the Lord. Verb, please. Thank you. Verb, praise. Who should praise? We. We should praise whom? Lord. There's my direct object. The Lord takes pleasures in them who fear him. The verb, please. Takes. Who takes? Lord. There's my subject. The Lord takes what? Pleasure. And pleasure is a noun. It's a direct object there. And this, later on we'll find out that this is a clause. But we're not going to look at that now. In fact, in your assignment for this week, you'll notice that I have verses in there. A lot of them are from Romans. But I just have underlined for you the section that I want you to either identify or diagram. And if it's not underlined, uh, let it go because we haven't learned clauses yet. And the book of Romans is filled with clauses and parenthetical expressions. So we are going to do a lot of work in Romans as we move through our course, but you'll want to, um, to note that as we go along. God loved us and sent us, and I think we already did that one, so we'll move on. Okay, here we go with the fun part, and we're going to be diagramming our subjects and our verbs and our direct objects. So when you're diagramming direct objects, there's some things to note. A direct object is diagrammed after its verb. And it has an honored position on the baseline. It says, I am an important part of the chassis of this vehicle, so to speak. And direct objects are diagrammed as an extension of the base on the horizontal line for the subject and the predicate. If you notice, it's divided by a vertical line, as we noted here. And touching, but notice it does not descend below the horizontal baseline. It's an important thing for you to know because when we did the subbing and verb, we descended below that. The direct object, because it is a noun or pronoun, may also have adjectives or modifiers, and we're going to learn about that at our next session. So we're not going to be diagramming those this evening or this week. All right. Uh, you'll find these examples in your handout. What page is that on? Does anybody have that in front of you? Is it page four? OK. Let's see if we can work our way through this. What's the verb in this sentence? And I'm going to put a bracket right around this right now, because that's a phrase. We're not going to work with that right now. Some people naturally do the things required by the law. What is my verb, please? Do. Who should do? People. People do what? Things. Here's my direct object. So, people do, uh, do things, don't they? And there we have it diagrammed. Sorry for that. I can't remember how to erase on here. I'll have to work on that later. Soon God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ. In Romans 2.16, we went through this one. So we know what we have going on here. Oh, that's it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Ah, oh, there it is. Thank you. Makes sense that you would use it. <laughs> so here we are. God will judge secrets. And there we have diagrams. So now we see what the main thrust, if you will, of our sentence is. Yes, Scott. Is it the machine that moves the subject? Yes. How do you diagram that? Do you put a bracket around it with the verb? You would put an X. An X marks the spot. The X becomes almost like the mystical representation of the understood you, and you put it in the subject box. So those are our direct objects. Should we go down and start talking about indirect objects now? So when I'm talking about the active verbs, 
Keep this in mind. We've got our direct objects that could come off of them. You're going to also see that we may have indirect objects. And you're also going to see we have objective complements. So we're still talking about active verbs. Now, indirect objects are interesting because they are rare. You could read for pages before you encounter one. For an indirect object to appear, a sentence must first have a direct object. And an indirect object is needed when the direct object alone does not tell the whole story. Here's a good observation for you to make that an indirect object is quite often a person. But it can be a thing that receives the direct object. It's made from a noun or a pronoun, usually receives the direct object after it's received the action of the verb, and it usually follows an active verb in the active voice. It can ask the question to whom or for whom a direct object is given, said, or shown. And you can insert the word to or for before an indirect object to see if indeed it is an indirect object, and that works quite well. So with that theory, let's do some practice with it and see if we can identify them. Uh, here's some more information for you. They are found in sentences that have verbs of giving, giving telling, or showing. So here's some verbs, for instance, offer, hand, teach, lend, promise, bring, get. And they come between the action verb and the direct object. So how will we diagram direct objects, indirect objects, once we find them and we're going to go through and find them? Sorry to say that the indirect object is not going to be on the baseline. Indirect objects are going to have to go below because they're not part of the main structure of that sentence. So they're diagrammed coming off of the verb, the action verb. They're a noun or a pronoun. And they um, are diagrammed with the slanted line coming off of the correct verb. And at the bottom of the slanted line, you draw a horizontal line parallel to the baseline. And you're going to place your direct object on this line. Now, I should have probably extended this line a little bit more. Typically, that's the case. These uh, diagrams are not easy to create. So I did the best I could. But quite often, you'll see these, this line extending below here a little bit. Mine didn't do that. So you'll have your subject, your action verb, direct object, and the noun or pronoun is on that base, uh, is on the line that is parallel to the baseline. When we study prepositions next session, you're going to see that prepositions are diagrammed the exact same way. However, the preposition itself will fall on this line. So we don't have anything coming on this line when we have an indirect object. The indirect object is going to be on that parallel line underneath the action verb. So that's how you diagram it. Let's see if we can find them. You have these examples in your handout, too. So you can look in your handout as we're going through those. All right, you ready? Um, let's try this example. He passed his guest the sugar. OK, we're going to go through the process now. We're going to find our verb first. What is the verb? Passed. Who passed? He passed what? Sugar. There's my direct object. I will listen to this. He passed the sugar to whom? Guest. And now we found our direct object. Yes, sir. Quick question. The uh, indirect object, it says always comes between the verb. Yes. I just want to make sure yes. I have that right. So yes, it, it does. Every time. If you have one. Remember, again, I qualified it by saying they're rare. But here I'm trying to help you find them when they are there. 
uh, we gave God the glory. Help me with this, please. Go through our process. Gave. Who gave? We. We gave what? Glory. That's my direct object, isn't it? We gave glory to whom? God. And there's my indirect object. Remember my hint that you could put the word to before to see if it indeed is an indirect object. We gave to God the glory. That makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, if I had to God written in there, then I have a prepositional phrase. But in this case, I have an indirect object. We gave the glory to God. And here again is the example of where you have it now as a um, prepositional phrase. Right here. He gave his father the money, or he gave him the money. Help me. Verb, gave, subject, he. He gave what? Money. To whom did he give the money? He gave to his father the money. See there, it makes sense, doesn't it? He gave him the money. He gave what? He gave money to him. Uh, they gave him a piece of broiled fish. You notice the, again, the repetition of the word gave, that's used a lot with um, indirect objects. They gave what? They gave, say it to me, please. What did they give? Peace. Uh, whoops, I don't want to say that. That's my prepositional phrase. So they gave what? Peace, yeah, that's a direct object. We also see an article there, don't we? To whom did they give the peace? Him. They gave to him a piece of boiled fish. There again is the way you can check it out to see if indeed it is an indirect object. Well, we found them successfully. Now let's see if we can diagram them. Again, looking at the structure of the diagram, keeping that in mind. And let's try this now. All right, remember how we identified it? We didn't find it in here because that's a prepositional phrase. So here we go with our diagram. They gave peace. Who they give the peace to? Him. And there's my diagram. Jesus gave the disciples the bread. I don't, did we do this one as a group? I don't think we did. So help me with this one. Here's my verb, gave. Who gave? Jesus. Jesus gave what? Bread. To whom did he give it? Here's the disciples. Jesus gave to the disciples the bread. So that read well. Jesus gave bread, is the main thrust of that sentence. And then at the bottom we see to whom he gave it. Okay. Now, we have our direct objects, we have our indirect objects, and now we have to talk about objective complements coming off of the verb. Now, we don't have them all the time, but once in a while we will, and so we want to be able to identify them. Sometimes needed in addition to direct objects to complete the sense of a verb, you have what's called an objective complement. If a noun, it explains or renames the direct object. So please notice this, students, the pattern right here. See how different that is than the indirect pattern? You have the subject, verb, direct object, objective complement. Remember the pattern with the IO? You have the subject, verb, IO, DO. So it's important for you to see these different patterns. A direct object is the inner complement, and the objective complement is the outer complement. And it could be introduced by the expletive as. It's interesting to note this. You're not going to find this, I don't think, in your textbook. But there are key factive, factative verbs that are used with objective complements. And I listed some of them for you here. Elect, appoint, choose, leave, declare, find, consider, render, name, call, entitle, color, die, and make. So let's try it. You have this in your handout. 
We elected George treasurer. What is your verb? Elected. Your subject is we. We elected who? George. There's my direct object. And notice this, we elected George, and it treasure renames him, so to speak. It gives you more information about him, and that becomes your objective compliment, telling you a little bit more about George. We consider George dependable. Notice the verbs that are being used here. Here's the verb elected, that's part of our list. Here's the verb consider. We consider George, tells us a little bit more about him, and this is functioning as an adjective here, but it's an OC, telling us a little bit more about George. Objective compliments can be nouns, pronouns, or adjectives. When you're diagramming the objective complement, you place the objective complement on the baseline and to the right of the direct object. So it gets a position on the baseline. The indirect object did not. I also want you to notice uh, the direction of the line that it's slanted toward the direct object, it's pointing to it, so to speak. All right, let's see what we can do with this. From Romans 1.19, uh, God has made his nature plain to them. God has made what? nature, and it tells us a little bit more about nature. The word is plain. It's giving just a little bit more information about nature there. So God has made nature plain. They will call him Emmanuel. They will call what? Him. Emmanuel is telling you a little more about the specific name, and that becomes your object complement. So again, thinking about the classification, we were just looking at active verbs now over here. We saw that there is quite a few direct objects in our sentences. There's sometimes indirect objects. There are sometimes objective complements, but direct objects you will find in abundance. Now we're switching our verbs, and we're switching them to our linking verbs or our be verbs. We're talking about what comes off of our linking and be verbs, the is, are, was, were, be, being, been, am. And what do we see going on in those types of sentences? Well, we see that you can have what's called a predicate nominative. Nominative means a noun or pronoun. Or we can have a predicate adjective that can be coming off of a linking verb. And again, I want you to remember to memorize that list because it'll help you as you're looking for them. Um, I believe I have some of these sentences in your handout. I have pages 11 through 13. A predicate nominative explains the subject. It can be a noun or it can be an adjective that completes a linking verb, and it describes a subject that comes after the linking verb. It follows the form of the to be verb. So keeping in mind, we have two types. We have predicate nominatives and we have predicate adjectives. We're in the nominative case when we're working with these. So we're just gonna take this through and we're going to find out what we have going on in our sentences. He had been a great teacher. We always go to our verb first, and our verb is? Had been. It's in the passive voice, isn't it? Uh, what is the subject? He. He had been what? Answer, teacher. That's called a predicate nominative, not a direct object, because it's coming off of a linking verb or a be verb. Remember what I said, while linking verbs can act in our sentences, they can act as a what? Equal sign. He equals teacher. 
He always remained a teacher. Remained, yep, and the teacher is the predicate nominative. Um, do you remember that I mentioned to you last week that linking verbs can sometimes take an, an action or a um, linking form, and those were the verbs taste, feel, smell, sound, look, appear, become, seem, grow, remain, stay. So you have to see how it's used in the sentence. In this case, it's used as a linking verb. Here's the word seemed. He seemed a gracious man. There it's being used as a linking verb. He seemed what? Ezra was a ready scribe. Here's my was. Ezra was what? Scribe. Predicate nominative. Some early men of great faith were Job, Enoch, and Noah. Where's my verb here, please? Mur, thank you. It's part of our linking verb list, isn't it? Is our was were. Who were? What's my subject? Men, thank you. Men were what? I have compound predicate nominatives. And that's how we find them. If you remember just to go through the process, you'll be able to find your parts of speech. Now, I wanted to go into uh, the verses in John 1 so that you can see the significance of the verb was and also how we see a predicate nominative coming off of that. And the forms are, of the be verb are intransitive, not linking, when the verb means to exist. So it's important for us to note this as we're going through this verse. The Lord Jesus Christ in these verses is called the Word. In John 1, 1, we have the preexistence of the word. It shows the internal incarnate word, his absolute deity. He existed in the beginning, not because he had a beginning, but because he is eternal, and he is God, and he is with God, and these verses pull that out. So let's go through as grammarians and see what we have going on here. We're going to take this in these compound sentences and pull apart our structure. In the beginning was the word. We're just going to talk about that for a minute. Where is your verb? Was. What was? Here's my subject. There you have an example of an inverted sentence that is beautifully and powerfully written. We know that in the beginning is a prepositional phrase, and we don't find our subjects there. So word was. Let's go to our next part of our sentence in the compound sentence. And the word was with God. Let's just talk about that for a minute. Where's my verb? Was. There's another was. What was? Word. There again, was word, word was. It's emphasized. And here's our prepositional phrase. And the word was God. Where's my verb? Was. What was? Word. Word was what? What is, my, what is God? Uh, what's coming off of what verb? Predicate nominative. And it acts as a what in your sentence? An equal sign, doesn't it? Word equals God. He was in the beginning with God. Where's my verb, please? Was. Subject was. He was. In this case, you have prepositional phrases. So it's just the statement, he was. And in John 1, 4, in him was life. Let's go to that one for a minute. Where's my verb? Was. There it's repeated again. What was? Life. There's my subject. This is your prepositional phrase. And the life was the light of man. Where's my verb? Was. What was? Life. And life was what? Light. What's light? Predicate nominative. Life equals light. There's your prepositional phrase. Do you see the repetition here? Do you see the, how it's written? Some of it's inverted, some's in the order. And you see the power behind these verses and the repetition of the word us and how strong and powerful that is. And it makes that very declarative statement. No questions about it. That Jesus Christ is the eternal word incarnate. This is the beauty. This is the power behind looking at what's going on in these verses so you gain an even greater appreciation for the statements that are made and the declared statements here. So with that in mind, let's go on and see how we can diagram these. We have our subject, we have our linking verb, and we have our predicate nominative. Please notice that when you have a predicate nominative, 
It has a slanted line that's pointing to the linking verb, and it's giving us the credit due. The predicate nominative also goes on the base line, and it points toward the subject. Let's try to diagram here. I am the true vine, John 15, 1a. Find the verb, please. Verb, please. Subject. I am what? This is my beloved son. Verb. What is the subject? This. Yeah, we have a demonstrative pronoun, don't we, there? This is what? Son. Okay, so we have our predicate nominatives down. Now we're going to look at that predicate adjectives can come off of linking verbs as well. They're descriptors, if you will. Uh, he will be sick. There's your subject, there's your linking verb, and here's your predicate adjective describing he. They suddenly became very quiet. You have your predicate adjective telling you more about what they became. He grew more and more silent. There you have your predicate adjective telling more about him and how he grew by your linking verb. So diagramming predicate adjectives is the very same way that you diagram predicate nominatives. It gets a place on the baseline. It has a slanted line that's pointing toward the verb. Let's try some. My grace is sufficient for you. From 2 Corinthians 12, 9a. Please give me uh, the subject, uh, the verb. What is? Grace. Grace is what? Sufficient. Grace is sufficient. The Lord is good. Is your linking verb? The Lord, Lord is what? Good. Okay. So we've been introduced tonight to our action verbs, which then can indeed have direct objects that come off of them. You can have an indirect object and direct object. You could have a direct object and objective complement. We talked about the linking verbs. Linking verbs can produce a predicate nominative or they can produce a predicate adjective. Now it's where the test comes. And I have verses that we're going to look at. And I'm going to ask you to go in there and help identify. I intentionally did not, uh, in ones that come up, uh, put down the subject of the verse because I want you to help find it. And then we're going to get away. And I'm not going to put the diagrams up there. And I'm going to help you help me put it together. So let's first start with this verse. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Of course, we know the rest of the verses and the evidence of things not seen. I just want to do the first part of that verse, please. And would you help me with it? Faith is a substance of things hoped for. What is the verb? What is? Faith. Faith is what? That is a very important thing to know. Remember, is X as an equal sign in the sentence? Faith equals what? Substance. I um, had someone ask me some years back to define faith. And this person I had talked to multiple times in giving the gospel. And the person said to me, define faith, but don't use a scripture to do it. I said, no, I will use a scripture to do it because I have the perfect definition of faith. Faith equals what? Substance. And also equals evidence. So here we have a, a verse with a predicate nominative. Faith is substance. For you are our glory and joy. Help me with this. What's a verb? What are? You the 
there's no subject. You are what? What are those? Predicate adjectives, yeah. So here's your verb, excuse me, your subject, here's your verb, here's your And then on the dotted line, you put your connector, and. Mm. I see them. Oh, you thinking maybe that they're an abstract idea? You know, you're right about that. I agree with you on that. Yes, I do agree with you on that. Thank you. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Bird, please. What is? Word is what? That's very good. Lamp and light. And then I put my connector right there, the dotted line. Do you have that? Can we go on to the next slide, or do you have it? OK, now this section is we're going to be diagramming, but I didn't put the structure on there for you, because the structure sometimes gives it away. So I thought I'm going to let you try it yourself and see how you do. So let's just take the first verse, the righteous shall be glad in the Lord. And I'm going to have you work through it first on your own, and then you can uh, give me your answers. Remember to go through your process, find your verb first, find your subject, see what's going on in the sentence. Now, in these sentences, they could have direct objects, they could have indirect objects, direct objects, they could have Direct object, object of complements, you could have predicate nominatives, predicate adjectives. So I'm mixing it up here and seeing if you're able to identify them. So when you're ready to give me your answer, please offer it. Anybody want to volunteer? Thank you. Shall be is the verb. Shall be what? Righteous is your subject. Shall be what? Predicate what? Adjective. Predicate adjectives because it's descriptive of righteous, glad righteous. Now we're ready to diagram, and my diagram's not going to look as nice as yours because I have to do this here on the... Uh, surface, but I'll do the best I can. Did you create your diagram? There's righteous, shall be, here's your predicate adjective, glad, on the baseline. Okay, try the next one. The king granted him all his request. Ezra 7, 6, E. Are you ready to offer? Thank you. Granted is the verb. King is the subject. The king granted. Okay. Granted request, very good. That's your direct object, correct? And what did I hear? Yes, him is the indirect object. Because remember, you can put a two in there to see if it's correct. The king granted to him all his request, and now we're ready to diagram it. Because I have an indirect object, Granted. Request. And he 
him is down here. Very good. From John 5, 35a, he was a burning and shining light. Work that out on your own, please, and then we'll talk about it as a group. Anytime you're ready. Okay, anybody want to offer assistance? Was the verb, the linking verb. The subject is he. He was what? Light. That would be my predicate nominative. So now, was light. It was the main part of that sentence. I have a few more for us to try. Just to make sure that you know how to diagram all of these correctly. He appointed the moons for the seasons from Psalm 104, 19a. Are you ready with this one? Appointed is your verb. Who appointed? He, there's your subject. He appointed what? Moons. And that is my direct object. Thank you. So now. That's how that looks. Okay, our final one is from Isaiah 48, 2. You call yourselves citizens of the holy city. Just remember to go through the process. Stray from it. It will serve you well. You ready? Notice you have the verb call. Take a hint. <laughs> okay, call is your verb. You is your subject. You call what? Yourselves. There's your direct object. It's one of those intensive. Oh, no, is it? Yes, because citizens is telling you more about it. And here's another way you can check it out. You can put the to be in here to see if it makes sense. Remember, I use that as another hint. If it works, it can be objective complement. You call yourselves to be citizens of the Holy City. So there you have your subject, verb, direct object, and object complement pattern. You call my diagram. So with the help from this PowerPoint, I want you to make sure you go into your textbook this week and read the sections that I have listed in your handout. This will be very helpful to you as well to review. 
the Becca book, and then um, working through the exercises will help you as well. You'll be able to identify these. Now next time when I return, uh, this is what we talked about this week, direct object, indirect object, objective complement, predicate nominative, predicate adjective. And when I return our next session, we will zero in on adjectives, words that add color and texture to writing, and also we're going to get to prepositions. Words that show a relationship between its object and another word in the sentence. So when we get to the adjectives and we get to the prepositions, we're going to add this to our diagrams and see how they all work together in a sentence. Next slide. So you have your assignment before you for this week, and there's diagramming, as we've seen here, and also identifying those parts. And if you have any questions, you can email me or text me or call me, and I'm here to help. Any questions before I go? I think I'm right at the hour. <laughs> When I am planning my uh, PowerPoints and my lessons, I'm trying to think, okay, can I get it all done in an hour and a half? How am I going to work through it? So as you can see, I moved through it rather quickly, but I hope that I've covered it sufficiently so you can do a good job on your assignments, but that you have a good understanding of it as well. All right? So thank you. Good to see you again. <laughs>